Lieutenant Governor Scott Bedke joined me on Thursday to talk about his endorsements in a handful of legislative races, what he's hearing from voters, and how he's settling into his role as Lieutenant Governor a year into the job. Thanks for joining us today. You know, you're a little bit more than a year into the job. <clears throat> how are you liking it so far? I love it. I, uh, I mean, what's not to love? I get to travel the state of Idaho. I get to interact with Idahoans and they get and they confide in me what their concerns are, what they'd like to see, things we could do better, things that we're doing good. Uh, I get to tap into Idaho's quality of life, which is not only our, the backdrop of our the natural beauty here, but we've got some, uh, some pretty interesting people here as well. And anyway, so I enjoy uh, being out and rubbing shoulders with our neighbors. You know, of, of all the state elected positions, <clears throat> the lieutenant governor is the most choose your own position there is, choose, mm -hmm. choose your own adventure position. Do you feel like you're making this job what you wanted to make it? Uh, of course, I'd never done it before, so I didn't know really what to expect. And every lieutenant governor that I've known has, has certainly had their own style and their own approach. Uh, I, I view myself as being a pro-Idaho uh, you know, policymaker. I want to be out in the communities. I want uh, those opinion makers in the communities to confide in me uh, so that we can keep the state one that we can all recognize, number one, and one that we can all be proud of, number two. And so I, uh, I purposely like to travel the state. Next week I'm going up to, uh, uh, to the north in the Coeur d'Alene area and we're gonna tour some of our uh, state parks. You know, we have a great state park system. That's something that I didn't ever really take advantage of in my other life and, and, I, and you know, and so I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward, and we're also hosting all the other state park directors from around the United States, and so I'm interested in, in visiting with them and, and speaking at their, uh, in, you know, at their program and then touring some of the things that make Idaho great with them. This is your second session yeah. as the president of the Senate, and you come to this job with experience, obviously, as the longest serving House Speaker. Um, in that job, you also had experience <clears throat> butting heads sometimes with the executive branch, which you're now a part of. Mm -hmm. You have experience now as Lieutenant Governor, as president of the Senate. Did you navigate that job differently this year with, with one session already under your belt? Uh, yeah, I think I did. Uh, you know, I was feeling my way the first year. You know, the presiding in the Senate part is not difficult for me. As you said, I, it, 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 uh, while it's a little different, it's pretty much the same in, in presiding as it was in the House. And, uh, but uh, the Lieutenant Governor is, is the President of the Senate and is the umpire. The umpire doesn't go to the team meetings. The umpire doesn't go to the practices. The umpire shows up and for the game, and uh, and that is completely different than it was for me as the speaker, where I, on, at least on some level, were participated in the practices, in the meetings, and and then uh, and then on some level was the umpire, just call it the presiding officer. So you don't you don't manage any of the day to day drama any of the day-to-day -day personality conflicts, you're aware of them, and people will, will come in and they'll ask you your opinion on this or that. And, uh, you know, fortunately, the governor and I, we get along and we are philosophically headed in the, in the same direction. We want the same good things for Idaho. And, uh, you know, and then, and then it comes about coming up with the, the agendas and getting those things carried out. And could we do it this way or that way? Well, I have, you know, I have a career of having a strong opinion and of how best to do it. And sometimes, you know, doing it the six way as opposed to the half a dozen way, uh, there'll be some things arise. But I, I, uh, I've learned to, you know, to participate in that, uh, you know, voice my opinions, voice my reasoning, and then have to step back. And I think good leaders always do that. They collect, they collect everyone's opinion and then there becomes kind of a consensus path forward. Uh, and so I, yeah, so I'm getting better at it. Uh, I, uh, I, was, I was blessed or cursed, I guess, with strong opinions. 
and uh, being having to, but to work in a group and to participate in a group dynamic is is not about one person having a strong opinion or a loud voice in the room or a strident voice in the room. And I think my role is to more is to bring out uh, the different ideas and make sure the ideas are heard and that are validated because everybody that's in the room is there for a reason because they earned a place in the room and therefore what they have to say is valid. You come to this job after coaching the other team, yeah. going from coach to umpire, the uh, new coach of that team, Speaker <coughs> Moyle, how do you think he's doing? I think he's doing good for Mike. I mean, uh, his, his leadership style is not Scott's leadership style. Uh, keep in mind that uh, Mike was the first person that I met when I became a new legislator back uh, in the day. And so we have been around each other for a long time. I think we know each other very well. Uh, I think we, re we work together pretty well. And, uh, and, now it's not, and now it's his job. Tag, you're it, Mike. And so I, it's not my job to second guess him. And just as, and so I, I kind of follow uh, Speaker uh, Newcomb's uh, example. He didn't interfere. I know Bruce had strong opinions. And, uh, and continues to have and strong can, opinions. And continues to have strong opinions. But, but he, let, he let those that followed him be the speaker. And I think that that's how it should be. The caucus and the, the House of Representatives picks their leader and then they, uh, and, uh, and then they go ahead that way. And so, uh, but I, I'm not going to nitpick any of his decisions or his approaches. They are his approaches and his decisions and that's his job. And the House of Representatives trusted him, uh, trusted him enough to give him that job. So it's not my place. You mentioned that as umpire, everyone who is in that Senate chamber has earned the right to be there. They're, they're duly elected officials. But you mm -hmm. have chosen to endorse in the upcoming primary in a handful of races, mm -hmm. um, including one in your own district, your, your representative, uh, Clay Handy. As a member of the executive branch who works primarily in the Senate, how did you get there? How did you decide whom to endorse? Well, I, he's my representative. And I endorsed uh, selectively in the Magic Valley as well because that's my home. And, uh, <clears throat> and I've been around these people, whether it's Linda Hartkin or uh, Clay Handy or, or whoever it is, I, tr I have been around these people for a long time and I trust them uh, to be a keeper of this concept of Idaho that I, that I love. And, uh, I, and I think it's high praise to be trusted and that's why I would recommend it. I, I a lot of times will run into people back home and they'll say, we're well, never around these people. We don't know them. You know, you're there all the time and you owe us your opinion because we trust you enough to be there. And so with that trust comes this responsibility to be candid and to be thoughtful. And so uh, I don't do that in a cavalier or a reckless way, but I, in those two examples, I trust Linda Hartkin, I trust Clay Handy because I know them to be trustworthy. We're seeing a lot of money in some of these races. As we've talked about on the show, we're also seeing a lot of money in very competitive precinct committee races. Are the stakes <coughs> in this Republican primary higher this year or is it about the same? Well, you and I have been doing this long enough to, to, to toss that question around every time. Is every this the, two years. Is this the two most years. important cycle? And, uh, and, I, and the answer to that is yes, because it is this cycle is the, is the cycle. And the decisions we make this time will have uh, ramifications down the road, just like the ones before. Now, have we made, do we make corrective measures? You know, and we will in two years, and we will in two years, and we will in two years. And by virtue of that fact, those are going to be the most important elections that we have or that we've ever had because that is the election we have. And elections are important. So therefore, they're the most important. I've seen a lot of these candidates' websites, both incumbents yeah. and challengers, and a lot of folks are running on education, they're running on funding, mm -hmm. they're running on taxes, but they're also mentioning a lot of social issues, which of course you know, get a lot of attention in both elections and in the media. But you mentioned before, 
you travel the state. You talk to everybody from firefighters to you know, the, the Rural Success Summit yes. last week, uh, <coughs> to schools and educators and ranchers. What are Idahoans really concerned about? Well, I asked when I was in the firehouse that morning, and, and it was, and the, and the bell hadn't started ringing. Now it, it quickly did, and the, and the firehouse cleared. But before everybody left, I asked him that exact question. What are you guys worried about? And these were, these were parents. They had kids in school. They, some of them were, were out of the military and, and on, the, you know, on the Pocatello fire, uh, was you know, firefighting. And they had kids in school and, and jobs and this and that. Life was happening to them. And those were the concerns that when they let their guard down and started talking, it was like talking to, to regular parents. They want the best for their kids, uh, their you know, pocketbook issues, everything costs a lot. They'd like to, uh, they like to enjoy Idaho's quality of life. And, and so they're always looking, you know, these guys were into outdoor recreation. And, uh, and motorized outdoor recreation. And, and so uh, they were looking to, you know, so if, when they're talking about themselves, they're talking about snowmobiles or side-by-sides or, or the hunting trip here, the hunting trip there, or where we're gonna go fishing, or where we're gonna take the family out to picnic, or the kids sure had a good time when we did this last year. We're gonna try to do that again. And, uh, and then we had some that were, that were there from, that were new to Idaho. And we're just still kind of blown away, blown away at all the opportunities that they had, you know, that Idaho afforded them and their young family. Uh, we have a really great state here, and we've we've been decades in laying the foundation for a really good state. And you cannot blame anybody for wanting to live here, and to take advantage of the things that that you and I have been able to take for granted, for. You know, decades. years, decades, right. generations, frankly, and so uh, you know, so we have these problems incident to growth, and uh, but they're not insurmountable. You know, if I'm in a if I'm in a in speaking to, into a group where it's divided, uh, you know, one thing that can bring a divided audience back together is to talk about education, because there's not one parent or grandparent in that room that doesn't want the best for their kids or their grandkids. And they understand. Life has kicked them around enough for them to understand that, that it is going to be way easier with a good education that leads to a good job. And it's still gonna to be tough enough, but then you have, uh, but you have an ability to adapt and to, uh, and to live and, so, uh, and to provide for your family and to have a few of the finer things of life. And so, and then they know that the, that education opens that door to that. And so if there's a heated, if you wanna bring the room back together, start talking about things we can do to make our education system better. Now, then we start talking about this or that and, and we go a hundred different ways, but everyone knows the value of education. And I think that's why, <clears throat> you know, I'm proud to be part of the, uh, the of, of this movement, not only of getting, you know, the literacy programs that we're doing, to uh, to pain our teachers enough to stay and to attract new teachers in. You know, one of our most in-demand careers in Idaho is teaching, and we need to always have high-quality, well-paid teachers in front of our kids and grandkids. And I, you know, and so those are the things that Idahoans want to talk about. You know, they'll grumble about the DMV, or they'll grumble about, you know, we need to get that road fixed, or they'll grumble about, you know, various and sundry things. But I think what really makes it, them tick is the, is the, you know, the pocketbook issues, public safety. There, are people are starting to talk about that, because it's it's been something that we've always been able to kind of take for granted in Idaho. It's a pretty safe place to live, and uh, you know, but it doesn't matter if we're number one in economic growth if we're not number one in public safety as well. And so these are the things that, when people let their guard down and talk to you, it turns out they're just regular folk and they're motivated by the same thing that we all are, is how are we gonna pay for stuff and we want the best for our kids. And, and if, but if I'm, uh, another thing that is coming up a lot, particularly in the 20-somethings and the 30-somethings is I can't afford a house and I want a house, and I'm doing everything I can to do it, and so this chase that happens 
uh, internally, <clears throat> you know, to, to get enough uh, resources to, to get in a house, I think is, is, is a big motivator out there as well. If I'm, <clears throat> if I'm at a community branding, you know, where all the friends and neighbors come and we, we still do that and get together out in, uh, in Oakley, and, and we're talking to those kids, and they're mostly kids because it's a young man's sport. Uh, they're they're worried about getting in that house. Is Idaho ready to help those kids out? In the well, and see, years? that's that's the dilemma. I you know, as a as a staunch Republican, lifelong Republican, I don't know how you plug public money into helping someone with a private. Uh, uh, problem of getting into a house. So I think we can have policies, we can have tax incentives, we can do up to a point, but I think much past that smacks of the principles that I don't, to which I do not espouse. And so that's that's always the, the fine line. Uh, I think that the market will eventually uh, take care of that. I'm seeing, you know, in other states where investors have scooped up a lot of these houses because the rents are so high and they become attractive uh, investment properties. And, and that's because the tax structure allows for that to be. And so you, the policy can manipulate that. And we're seeing states, uh, other states uh, do that to make these, uh, you know, a residential home not be an investment property. And if it is, then it's taxed differently than it, than it is if it's a residence. Okay. So there are things we can do. We're gonna have to leave it there. Lieutenant Governor Scott Bedke, thank you so much for joining us. Are we us. done already? Already. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you.